may not be suitable for all audiences. Good morning. How can I help you? I'm just checking out these artifacts. Art, 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 art 101 with Mr. Burger. Scholars, welcome back to Art 101 with me, Mr. Berger. I'm a professional artist and master educator, and I attempt to provide the best in art historical content. If you like this content, make sure you like, share, and you subscribe. Right, Etta? Is that what you did? Yeah. Oh, you're too young, but good advice anyway. Hey, you stop trying to carry on a conversation with you, you know? Have you ever heard of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? You yeah. have? Well, did you know that the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles are all named after Renaissance artists? They're all depicted here on this shirt. And the today, we're going to talk about all four of the inspirations behind the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Okay? Okay. All right. If we think about the greatest sculptors of all time, one that has to be included in that list is Donatello Bardi. He is absolutely one of the greatest sculptors of the Renaissance and all time. He was born in Florence, Italy, as the son of a wool carter. Now, it is unknown who first taught Donatello stone carving, but it is thought that he learned from a sculptor working on the Cathedral of Florence in about 1400. Now, we know that Donatello's first formal instruction came under Lorenzo Ghiberti, he was 20 years old when he began in Ghiberti's studio. Ghiberti was a sculptor that is best known for his creations of a second set of doors that was to go with the ones that were designed by Andrea Pisano for the baptistry right next to the cathedral in Florence. Look at you laying down the law. They respect me. Donatello was also instructed by Ghiberti's rival, Filippo Brunelleschi, and this is where he would learn the practical use of one-point perspective for the creation of three-dimensional effects on a two-dimensional surface. Donatello also had a very vast knowledge of ancient sculpture. Now, he's more knowledgeable on this topic than virtually any other artist due to the fact that he did some research and utilized direct inspiration from these ancient examples. Now he, along with Brunelleschi, even went so far as to study these ancient ruins in Rome for two years. Ah, fiddlesticks. One of the crown jewels of Donatello's bronze sculpture work was his 1430 creation of David. In this work, Donatello creates the first large-scale freestanding nude since the classic times. Now what does classic mean? Basically, anything that's classic is rooted in Greek and Roman times, so anyway. This is truly a rebirth of old ideas. This young and slightly effeminate David is one of Donatello's most technically classic sculptures that he would ever create. This work is also responsible for giving a reappearance to contrapposto, or a natural weight shift in a standing human. But who the sculpture was actually made for is completely unknown, but it was likely a de' Medici that commissioned the work. And we assume this because its first appearance was at a de' Medici palace. This would have been the courtyard at Lorenzo de' Medici's wedding in 1469. Shortly after creating David, Donatello became employed at the de' Medici family for 10 years, from 1433 until 1443. I believe you. One of my personal favorites was done in wood. After suffering some unknown illness while working in Padua, one of the two works that he had created between 1450 and 1455 was Mary Magdalene. Now this is not a biblical Magdalene, but a post-biblical Mary Magdalene. The rumor of her story was that she had gone to live life in repentance in the desert. And we see her in her older age, without her fine clothes and without her beauty. Now this is an extremely psychological Mary and is very tense with its emotional feelings. The sculpture was sent back to Florence to be placed in the Florentine Baptistry and it is now on display in their museum. That belongs in a museum! So do you! 
As for Donatello the man, there is very little known that's actually known of his character or his personality. He was described as a man with very simple tastes, and it is said that he demanded a large degree of artistic freedom from his clients when doing works. It is fair to say that he was a devoted artist to his work, and he did not marry or have children so that he could focus on his work, and his work, in a sense, really became his children or offspring. So although the name Donatello gives other connotations and we might think of other things from pop culture, we do need to recognize that this artist was a very finely tuned, highly intelligent creator of some of the best sculptures in the world, and he needs to be given the credit and his due for that. What a strange person! Leonardo da Vinci was trained in many areas and felt that artists should be the most educated people anywhere. This belief was largely because he felt that artists would come into contact with so many different areas and so many different things in the world that they must understand how everything works in order to depict it properly. Leonardo himself was trained in painting, sculpture, botany, ornithology, engineering, cosmology, anatomy, geology, physics, architecture, city planning, and music. His explorations of nature and anatomy began at a very young age. It is said that he understood gravity before Newton, explained the twinkling of the stars before Kelper, and invented a telescope before Galileo. It is believed that Leonardo wanted to be a doctor, however, it was not possible at that time because he was illegitimately conceived and so the so-called noble professions were off-limits to him, as they were also off-limits to grave diggers, priests, and criminals. He was not even allowed to attend a university, so he would independently study, and thus his beliefs in the knowledge of an artist were really rooted in who he really was and what he could do. The handful of artworks that remain of Leonardo's are some of the most recognized in the world. However, every artist needs a start and they need good training. Leonardo's skills were helped first develop under Andrea De Cione, who was an early Italian Renaissance sculptor, who had a part in training many of the Renaissance sculptors and artists. Now, Diccioni was a Florentine artist and was a one-man art university. Oh my God! Leonardo himself was a very passive man. Uh, in his youth, they say he was quite handsome. He was very charming, somewhat charismatic, a bit careless with money, pretty respected employer. He employed many artists, musicians, and jesters to keep him entertained, and he had amassed quite a bit of wealth through the various projects that he actually completed. Truth be told, it was a struggle for him to complete his work, and many believe that he would have had a diagnosis of ADHD or dyslexia, obviously well before those things were ever in existence, but he definitely displayed those traits. He was also very well known as a generous, athletic, well-spoken, and funny man. Oh, huh, meaning what? Originally titled The Cheerful Woman, and in Europe still known as The Joking One, Leonardo put quite a bit of work and effort into making her as perfect as he could, and actually carried it around with him the majority of his life. It is said that the Duke of Milan, Ludovico Saborza, hired him to paint his mistress, Cecilia Gallerani, but the painting was never delivered. The work was eventually sold to King Francis I of France, which is why it is currently in Paris today. Anyway, it would pass down the royal line and eventually find its way to Napoleon Bonaparte's ownership. He would hang it in his bedroom, and they say that he loved the painting so much that he would kiss it every night before going to bed and first thing every morning. Without question, Mona Lisa is the most recognized artwork in the world. Now, many have asked, why is she so famous? And I've been to see the Mona Lisa, and it's really a kind of a small, unassuming painting, but it is just crazy popular. She just goes a little mad sometimes. Based on my research, here's what conclusions I've drawn. When it was first created, it was copied by other artists like Raphael Sanzio and it has been continued to be copied over and over and over again. It has been parodied over and over and over again. And Mona Lisa has been used 
for product after product after product to sell the product. This relatively small painting on a wood plank has been recreated so many times it's really ingrained in our popular culture. It was influential from the get-go and that snowballed into what it is today. Now along that path, the work was stolen in 1911 and has very much thrust the painting into the media and into popular culture. And that's why I believe it is such a popular painting today because of its long, hundreds of year history of its snowballing into more and more of the high marquee paintings of the world. How do you want me to pose? Uh, uh, anyway, it's fine. Uh, I can't miss you. Arguably the most famous painting that he ever would create was The Last Supper. And this depiction would completely reshape how the world would create Last Suppers forever after. This painting is of a formal balance. His overarching concept was to depict this exact moment. And this would change the depictions of the Last Supper because every Last Supper, basically after this point, would depict this exact same moment as well. This is the moment when Jesus reveals that one of his disciples would betray him, as noted in Luke 22:21. Now in terms of the work, Leonardo worked crazy slow on this project, taking time that very much angered the church that was paying him on the commission. The prior of the church reported back to the others that Leonardo would enter in the morning, looking around for about half an hour, placing a few brush strokes on the wall, and call it a day's work. He would spend a year trying to find a face model for Judas. This very much frustrated the prior and he was pushing that on Leonardo, so Leonardo basically gave him an ultimatum. Either allow him the time to find the face for Judas, or he would use the likeness of the prior as the face of Judas and finish the work right now. So he was allowed all the time that he wanted. This work, extremely well known in the modern world, has risen into popularity and in modern context has even exploded in popularity after Dan Brown's release of his novel, The Da Vinci Code. Fact, fiction, I don't know. Regardless of your take on the things in the book that are presented as true, the important thing is that we're looking, examining, analyzing the works of art that might not have happened without a prompting by this novel. Oh boy, was that a mistake! Although his name is very much synonymous with art and art making, only eight major artworks by Leonardo da Vinci survive today that we can attribute to him. Although these great works of his live on today, he would pass away at the age of 67. Michelangelo to see you, Your Holiness. Who? Born under really unique circumstances, Michelangelo Bonarotti's mother was too sick to care for him after his birth and so he was placed in the care of a wet nurse. After some time, he would be reintroduced into the family. However, sadly, his mother died when he was six years old. At a young age, he was very into art, but his father was not so encouraging. He and one of Michelangelo's uncles felt that an artist in the family would be a disgrace, and they often beat him to kind of persuade him away from the career path. However, at the age of 13, he was apprenticed to the Gilandio brothers, who were fresco painters in Florence. During his year under their tutelage, he would learn drawing through copying and observing things around him. The following year, he went to study at the Lorenzo de' Medici Art Academy under the instruction of Bertoldo di Giovanni, who is a student of the renowned Renaissance artist and sculptor Donatello Bardi. Michelangelo Bonarotti was a sculptor, poet, architect, painter, and inventor. Not only did he work in these areas, but he excelled in every single one of them. After returning home in 1492, Michelangelo would receive special permission from the church to dissect cadavers. Now he wouldn't do this very long because it made him quite sick to his stomach and it greatly affected his diet, so he was done with it. Damn barbarians. He would work in Florence for a little bit and then find his way to Rome where he would create his Pieta at the age of 25. This work was originally designed as a burial marker but ended up being a fixture in the Vatican. And this is the only work that he ever signed. 
He went in and he heard other people attributing this work to another artist, and he could not handle it. And so he came back in the night and he wrote his name across the sash, running across Mary's chest. However, he did regret this selfish act and never signed another work again the rest of his life. He would leave Rome for Florence once again at the age of 26. He would begin his career in Florence known as a loner, he once said, I have no friends and I want none. He hated honors. He didn't want any sort of public praise of himself or his work, although I think deep down inside, clearly he did. Otherwise, he wouldn't have wrote his name across the Pieta. Anyway, he was remembered being very temperamental, a devout Christian, a hypochondriac, very forceful and suspicious of others anti-social, blunt, kind of a slob, yet a very hard worker. It is said that he would work so hard and long that he would go many days without even undressing or washing, even at a time when people would take a bath weekly, he was not big on hygiene. And when he would take his boots off, a layer of skin would come off with them. On occasion, he compared himself to a scarecrow with a scraggly beard, although he did have fairly extreme wealth. Michelangelo's lifetime earnings were 50,000 large gold florins. What the heck does that really even mean? To put it in perspective, in American dollars as of 2021, the average American income is $70,000. You know, usually over the course of a lifetime, one or two million dollars is about what you're going to earn. Over the course of Michelangelo's lifetime, he would have earned somewhere in the neighborhood of $17 million American in today's money. So that's pretty substantial wealth. And he was very thrifty with his money. Living off the very basics, water was kind of unclean. It was safer to drink wine. So he would often just have a meal of a piece of bread and wine, and that was it. That is what the Cretans drink. On August 16th of 1501, Michelangelo would sign the contract to begin one of his great masterworks, the 13-foot, 5-inch high Statue of David. He had acquired this block of damaged marble from some other artists that had attempted a David but failed miserably. I have another video that goes more in depth on that, so you can check that one out. What are they even talking about? I'm the world's greatest sculpture, and I'm a very pretty boy. Once that work was completed, he was looking for more work to do, so he would accept a commission to create a mural for the city of Florence. Now, strangely enough, I also have a video on that. Both of those videos and more can be found down in the description. Shut up. In February of 1508, Michelangelo was leaving Bologna for Florence, but by May 10th of that year, he was on his way to Rome, so the discussions must have went in a positive direction. Now, the first project that he needed to complete was in the personal sanctuary of the Pope. This was going to be an 85 foot high, 133 foot long by 43 foot wide ceiling that was currently decorated with a bunch of gold leaf stars on a blue painted background. Why did they have one of the great sculptors doing a painting? Basically, it was a hit job. There were artists that wanted to make Michelangelo look foolish. They wanted him to look as though he was incompetent as an artist. And so they wanted to set him up for failure. But little did they know that it would blow up in their faces and he would create one of the greatest fresco paintings ever created in the history of mankind. Now this was a four year long endeavor to create the painting and there were a lot of ups and downs and fine detail points to explain how this great painting even came to be that I'm not going to get into in this video, but I will make a video that explains all of those details in the future. But the 14-phase painting was finished after four years of labor on October the 31st, 1512. The impressive collection of 343 figures was unprecedented, especially on an arched ceiling like this. The images in these panels were influenced not only from the Bible, but also from Plato, Savonarola, as well as his own personal belief system. At the age of 89, the elderly master returns to his artistic roots as he develops plans and the rough sculpture of yet another Pietà. He was working on the project long and hard hours. 
he was somewhat under the weather when he would finally go to bed and remain there for six full days. He would pass away with this work like several others unfinished. He would pass away in Rome and his remains would be transferred to Florence where he is still entombed today. Without question, Michelangelo is viewed as one of the greatest artists of all time. Personally, I consider him at the top of the list. But Michelangelo being Michelangelo, as great as he was, he would see himself as a, quote, poor and noble and crazy man. Well, son, since you haven't learned to respect your elders, it's time you learn to respect your betters. Oh. The youngest of the great artists of the Renaissance was Raphael Sanzio, as mentioned. His father, Giovanni Sanzio, was a great painter and no doubt he passed along this knowledge to his son. Two of Giovanni's assistants, Evangelista di Plan, di Mileto, and Petro Pellegino, mentored and continued the training of young Raphael in the techniques of fresco and other forms of painting that would serve the young artist very well as he continued beyond his own family studio. This is where the power lies! Raphael had a reputation and was often praised for his very pleasant personality. He was quiet and laid back sort of a guy, but very successful with life. Many would consider him a guy with a flawless character, very sweet natured, and quite good looking. And partially because of that, he also had a reputation for being a little bit of a ladies man. Now, he was never married, but he did have a few women that he was known for hanging out with, if you, if you understand my meaning. Now, it is said, even though he had a lot of women in his life, he wasn't going to get too serious with them because it is thought that he was open to the idea of eventually becoming a cardinal and a serious relationship would have prohibited that, but obviously that was never his lot in life. He was also known as a great lover of animals as he had a zoo in his house that included chickens, squirrels, badgers, monkeys, and even a raven that he trained to talk. I remember you. <coughs> Pretty bad. <laughs> Near the end of 1508, Sanzio was summoned to Rome by Pope Julius II where he was commissioned to paint a series of paintings in the papal apartments that were being converted into his library. The books in his library were divided into four basic categories, theology, philosophy, justice, and medicine. Now this particular pope had a dislike for doctors, so poetry took the place of the medical books in his library. Anyway, each set of books had a fresco painting that represented the major contributions of that area of study. Of these frescoes, Raphael would paint three of the four. This process began with some sketches that were done in ink or chalk, and then those preparatory drawings would be used to create the final fresco on the wall. Fresco being a pigment and plaster sort of paint application. The first fresco in this series was the Dispute of the Sacrament. Now, when these ideas were developed, the Pope had commissioned his ideas and even outlined the works in a general theme and characters. On these, he would begin at the top of the painting and work his way down on a scaffold. Once the first one was complete, he would start working on the second. And this was under the umbrella of philosophy. He had created what was originally titled Knowledge of Causes, where we would find a depiction of the ancient Greeks in a simulated school of Athens. At the center, we see Plato lecturing at the head of the class flanked by statues of Apollo, the god of poetry and music, and Minerva, the goddess of wisdom. And who is Plato? He was very much influenced and looked up to and revered his contemporary Leonardo da Vinci, and so he paints Plato in the likeness of his idol Leonardo da Vinci. Side note, this is a bit of an ironic move since Plato had condemned the arts and even banned painters from the city. Have you ever heard of Plato, Aristotle, Socrates? Yes, morons. 
At any rate, much of the fresco is actually based on variations of Leonardo da Vinci works of art, which he very much admired. As a matter of fact, he had copied sketches of his famous Mona Lisa painting, and not the Mona Lisa painting that hangs in the Louvre, but the original Mona Lisa painting that is actually underneath the painting, the original Mona Lisa painting before he repainted Mona Lisa on top of it. But moving forward, this collection of the greatest Greek minds is underneath the unfinished St. Peter's Dome, which was a symbol of free thought. And standing here we see Plato with his finger pointing to the heavens, a symbol of divine glory as he holds his own book, Timaeus, where he discussed the nature of the universe. At Plato's side is his student Aristotle who points to the ground, a symbol of the humanistic times that they were living in. And he holds a copy of his book, Ethics, in which he explains that happiness is only achieved when we understand philosophical truths and there are clusters or groupings of other individuals throughout the work. There are teachings of many academic fields. For example, we see a grouping of students learning mathematics from Pythagoras. Clearly, this mathematician is teaching underneath the statue of Apollo because he was into studying the harmony of numbers and music scales known as octaves. Behind Pythagoras, we see an old man in the corner. This is Zeno, the founder of Stoic philosophy, who is most likely debating his ideas with Epicurus, who had his Epicurean philosophy, as he writes in his book. On the opposite side, as we look at it on the right side of the painting, we see the bald-headed Euclid holding a compass on a slate. On the neck of his tunic, it reads RVSM, the only signature of sort on here, which stands for Raphael Verbenos Suomano, or Raphael of Urbino, his hand. Standing next to Euclid, holding the globe with his back to us, is Ptolemy, who studied Earth's geography. Facing him and us is Zoaster, an astrologer priest and founder of the Magi. He and Ptolemy are teaching Raphael in the black cap and his best friend, Il Sodoma. He was the Pope's painter prior to Raphael taking the job. Slumped on the steps is Diogenes with his beggar's cup. He was a philosopher who made his home on the streets of Athens and made a virtue of extreme poverty. This painting was painted on a wall in a room that was used by the Pope to sign various papers and documents. It's very close, just down the hall from the Sistine Chapel where Michelangelo Bonarotti had created his paintings on the ceiling of that Sistine Chapel. Because the Sistine was such a large and unique project, it was unveiled in two parts. After the first half was unveiled, Raphael went to the higher-ups to ask the Pope to allow him to finish the ceiling. Of course, Michelangelo protested. Clearly, the work was continued and finished by Michelangelo, and Raphael went on to paint the other rooms and to do other projects in the Pope's apartments. At the same time, he was so impressed with what Michelangelo had done, he felt that he had to incorporate something of Michelangelo into the School of Athens, just like he had other contemporaries like Leonardo. And so he goes back to the School of Athens. It was finished for over a year, but he was so awestruck that Raphael smashed out a part of the fresco plaster and replaced that with a depiction of Heraclitus into the painting. And Heraclitus, sitting by himself, propped up on a block of stone, was created in the likeness of Michelangelo in the fall of 1511. Now, the association of Heraclitus to Michelangelo is a bit of a comment on how Raphael viewed Michelangelo. Heraclitus was an individual that was a bit hard to understand due to his riddle-like philosophies. He lived his life alone and was always very suspicious of rivals trying to take his ideas. Raphael was able to find some level of admiration for Michelangelo, 
even though Michelangelo saw Raphael as a envious copycat of a punk kid. You know what your problem is? You have no game. <laughs> Again, there are a lot of ties that we think of when we think of Raphael Sanzio, when we think of Raphael in general. We think about the other popular culture sorts of icons and things that that raises in our mind. But really, my hope is through this video, we understand that he was a gifted human being. He had developed his skills from a very early age, and he used those skills to adorn and decorate the world, creating some marvelous works of art that we can enjoy and appreciate beyond any other pop culture reference. I hope you appreciate that as much as I love bringing it to you. And one last side note, did you know, Adabetta, that this is the shirt that I wore the day that you were born? No. Oh my gosh, isn't that crazy? It's true though, this is the shirt that I wore the day you were born. <laughs> oh, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. That's better. Thank you very much.